So, uh, good morning, everybody. We're going to pick up uh, from where we were last week. We talked about uh, some yeah. stuff around the revolution, and we looked at uh, really three episodes in America around the revolution. Uh, before that, one was the um, was the story of, and I'm going to put everybody on mute for right now. Uh, and if you have a question, you can raise your hand either like this, or you can use the raise my hand button on, on Zoom. Um, we looked at the episodes around the Dutch West Indies Corporation and Peter Stuyvesant, uh, who was a rabid anti-Semite and tried very hard to keep Jews from inhabiting New Netherland um, unsuccessfully. And we talked about the similarity between Peter Stuyvesant and all of the Jews in New York who may have gone to Stuyvesant High School or taken advantage of other resources around New York City that are named for Peter Stuyvesant, um, maybe even residents of, of, of Bed-Stuy, who knows, right? And compare that to Addison Meisner, right, here in Boca Raton, who in the same way tried very hard to keep Jews out of Boca Raton, and now so many of us live in neighborhoods or go to places that are named for Addison or Meisner, uh, including me, who lives in, of all places, Meisner Point in, uh, in west of Boca Raton. Um, we looked then at the interchange between President Washington and the Newport, Rhode Island Hebrew congregation, now known as Toro, and um, the when he went to visit and the letters that were sent back and forth of how we should all live under our own vine and fig tree and be happy as Jews in this new land, uh, in this new Canaan, which will come back to us today. And then as a comparison, we saw what happened just a half a generation later with Napoleon um, and how after the height of the French Revolution, very quickly Napoleon got very, very wary of the Jewish population and really, um, put them in their place, so to speak, and question whether you could be Jewish and be loyal to the French empire. Um, and I brought that up as a, as a contradistinction because what we, saw, what we see in, in Western Europe over and over and over and over again, all the way up to in the 20th century, is this question of whether or not a Jewish person can be loyal to their nation. Right. And it, it sows the seeds of this question of dual loyalty. Right. To whom is the Jewish person loyal when there is the nation of Judaism, right? the people of Israel that we call ourselves and the political nation in which we live? And what's interesting about that is buried deep in our tradition and exercised over and over and over again is this principle in Hebrew. Actually, it's Aramaic of what's called Dina de Malchuta Dina, right? So Dina, Dalad Yud Nun Aleph, is Aramaic for Hadin in Hebrew, which means the law. So the law, Dina, Malchuta, Hamalchut, the sovereignty, the kingdom, the kingship, Dina, the law. The law of the sovereignty is the law. The law of the land is the law. And what that means is, as a Jewish person, we are religiously obligated to follow the political law of the land. It's a religious obligation that I be a law-abiding citizen. And that is true, whatever the laws are, um, it gets interesting to play that into things like civil disobedience, right? But I also am a person who believes that if you participate in civil disobedience, and you are prepared to accept the, the consequences of that, right? If you protest and you and participate in a sit-in and you are prepared to be detained and arrested for your civil disobedience, I think you're following the law, right? You are using the law to show why the law ought to be changed and you are willing to accept the act of being arrested because you have broken the law in that way. I think you are following the principle of Dina de Malhuta Dina when you do that. Um, others may disagree with me, but that's my own feeling about what it means to engage in civil disobedience. So that's where we were in around the turn of the 19th century, right? We had the 17th century with, with, um, with Stuyvesant, we had the 18th century with George Washington, and an example from the early 19th century, Napoleon. We are now going to move today into the next period of American history that I want to go over, which is, um, and we talked, we're going to have we have, the, we have the colonial and revolutionary, we have the civil war, turn of the century and contemporary life. So today we are gonna get into the civil war. 
Um, and we're going to speak at length today about one particular episode that carried on for several years around the Civil War. Um, we're going to first read a prayer for the Confederate States soldiers, a prayer that was penned by a rabbi in Richmond, Virginia, just to give a little bit of flavor to all of this. But we're going to spend most of the day looking at Jan Grant's General Order Number 11 and what happened around that. Raise your hand if you are familiar with Grant's General Order Number 11. A few of you are, several are not. Fantastic, just what the teacher wants to hear. A few know and most don't, which means the learning is gonna be fantastic. All right, here we go. Prayer for the Confederate States soldiers. This was penned by Reverend Reverend Max Michelbacher, who was the leader of Congregation Beth Ahaba in Richmond, Virginia. Can anyone translate for me Beth Ahaba? Raise your hand if you think you know. Philip. House of Love. House of love, very good, right? Beth or, you know, Beth is an Anglicization of the word Beit in Hebrew, right? We are Beth El, Beit El, the house of El, the house of God. Ahaba, right? An Anglicization of the word Ahava, which means love. So the Reverend Max Mickelbauer, who is the leader, the minister at Congregation Beth Ahaba, of course, he was a rabbi, wrote these words. And the words begin, Shema Yisrael Anai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. It was in the document, which I've seen, it was written out in transliteration. I'm thinking there's a really thick Virginia accent in some of these words, which is why it's transliterated so. But this is a direct transposition of the way he wrote these words on the documents. Oh, God of the universe. You know what? I don't need to read. Can I have a volunteer to read? Debbie, go ahead. Unmute yourself, Debbie Jackman, if you want to read. Go ahead. O God of the universe, although unworthy, though my manifest whole transgressions, I approach the seal of thy mercy to crave thy favor and to seek thy protection. I supplicate thy forgiveness. O most merciful Father, for them... <laughs> many transgressions and of the oft repeated disobedience, which is so small, which caused thee to command destruction over me. Behold me now, O my father, supplicating thy protect, protection. Thou who art near when all other aid falleth, O spare me, guard me from the evil that is impending. All right, so stop right there. And this is for everybody, not just Debbie. Anything in here that seems unusual, out of place, bothersome, offensive? I don't think so. This seems like a really typical sort of, you know, late medieval, early modern, right? The language is very sort of 19th century, very formalized, right? Supplicate thy forgiveness, so right out of the Union Prayer Book kind of stuff. Um, but intellectually, ideologically, theologically, right? We are basically, we're buttering up God, right? God, we are so little, you are so great. God, you're such a good forgiving person, right? I'm so, I, I am so un, uh, I am so undeserving, right? Which means I'm gonna ask you for something now, right? But nothing in this is particularly bothersome yet. Who wants to read the next piece? I'll read. Helen, go ahead. All right. O oh Lord, ruler of the nations, destroy the power of our enemies. Grant not the longings of the wicked. My bad. Hang on. Press the wrong button. Okay. Ready? No. Now. All right. The we Okay. O oh Lord, ruler of the nations, destroy the power of our enemies. Grant not the longings of the wicked. Suffer not his wicked device to succeed, lest they exalt themselves. Selah, as for the heads of those that encompass me about. 
Let the mischief of their own lips cover them. Let burning coals be cast upon them. Let them be thrown into the fire, into deep pits that they raise not up again. Psalm 140, be unto the army of this confederacy as thou were of old unto us, thy chosen people. Inspire them with patriotism. Give them, when marching to meet or overtake the enemy, the wings of the eagle in the comp, in the camp. Be thou their watch and ward, and in the battle strike for them. O mighty God of Israel, as thou didst strike for thy people on the plains of Canaan, guide them, O Lord of battles, into the paths of victory. Guard them from the shaft and missile of the enemy. Grant that they may never advance to wage battle and battle in thy name to win. Grant that not a standard be ever lowered among them. O oh Lord, God, Father, be thou with us. So here, nothing particularly to the ideology of the Confederacy, but clearly identifies the Confederacy and with great fervor, right? This is what a rabbi in the 1860s would say to ask for the blessings of his troops. Um, and what's amazing in my mind is how he sees in his mind that the, that the plight of the ancient Israelites who were moving to where? The promised land, right? To freedom. That he identifies himself and the cause of the Confederacy with the cause of the ancient Israelites who were going into Canaan. Alan Lev, can you read the last piece of this for us? If I can pull it back up on the screen, hang on. I'm on a small monitor today. I got, it's not as easy for me to know where I am. Wait. Uh, I'm gonna go too far. Here we go, give unto. Give unto the officers of the army and of the Navy of the Confederate States, enterprise, fortitude, and undaunted courage. Teach them the ways of war and the winning of victory. Guard and preserve, O Lord, the president of the Confederate States and all officers who have the welfare of the country truly at heart. Bless all my fellow citizens and guard them against the sickness and famine. May they prosper and increase. Hear me further, O Lord, when I pray to thee for those on earth dearest to my heart. O bless my father, mother, brothers, and sisters. If married, my wife and children. O bless them all with the earthy and heavenly good. May they always look up to thee and may they find in thee their trust and strength. O oh Lord, be with me always. Show me the way I have to go be, to be prepared to meet thee here and hereafter. So what do we think? What does this it's mean? Bland. It's kind of bland, right? He doesn't totally get into, you know, he doesn't explain necessarily why the cause is what the cause should be, but he also doesn't pull any punches, right? Yeah. He's saying we're willing to die for this. Yeah, yeah, right. And God be with me when I do. If I'm, re if this is when I'm going to meet my Maker, let me meet my Maker in this moment. Margaret. Well, it's no different than any other. Uh, prayer for any other war. Yeah. There's no there, there's there's no discussion on the the uh, the reasons that they're fighting and what their uh, what their philosophy is. It's strictly to protect them and that they win over whatever the enemy is. Uh, it's nothing against. There's no discussion on why they're fighting. Yeah. Yeah. Does it strike anybody as surprising to hear a, pr a fervent prayer like that on behalf of the Confederate soldiers and really words that he was hoping the Confederate soldiers would use themselves before they went into battle? Is it surprising no. Rabbi would make that, that prayer? Not to the Virginian in the room. Well, here's the thing. Say it. I mean, you know, 
I can't, t you know, I lived in Charlotte for a while. I mean, they were um, the cemetery, a lot of Confederate soldiers in the Jewish cemetery. Um, right. Listen, we all know that there were, there were Jews who had slaves. I mean, I'm, it's not correct. I, I mean, we know that, but the Jews were no different than anybody else. Maybe some and not as many uh, would have slaves, but that's how it was. Does it surprise, uh, Margaret, you're absolutely right. Um, I think the thing that struck me was that not this wasn't like a particular slaveholder. It was a rabbi, right? A rabbi who comes into this conversation, I think, differently than a landowner, right? This was not Judah P. Benjamin, for example. By the way, for those of you uh, who are familiar with Judah Benjamin, um, this week, the monument in Charlotte, North Carolina, to Judah Benjamin was taken down. Really? With the support of the Jewish community, yep. Wow. Yeah, See, I'm not in agreement with all that stuff. It's terrible. Isn't that interesting? I think taking down all of these statues, that's, this is no different than, you know, when you were in Selma and you go across the bridge, it's at Peter's Bridge, even the black community, they wanted it to stay there because it says, because yeah. it's, it's a memory and it's about the history and it just, and it brings back what it is. And I think with all this business with the statues, et cetera, it's the same thing. I mean, and first of all, especially with the presidents, no one is all bad. They all had these issues. I don't right. want to get off of it, but it's- well, I don't want to go just, until, until 1025. Yeah, let's stick, let's stick this, but it's just, it's an interesting piece. So I shared this only to give a little bit of flavor, right? Um, this document is a single document from history written by a single rabbi. Um, but it's interesting to know that, it, you know, we, I think many of us knew that there were Jews who were fighting on both sides. Um, and maybe it's just because I was holding rabbis above everybody else from the 1860s that I would have expected, frankly, I would have expected more um, and a better, a, a better and stronger moral yeah. compass from the rabbinate, perhaps. Um, but I'm mistaken to have thought that. Um, and we have this from the reverend. Maybe if he was a rabbi, not a reverend, it would have gone differently. I don't know. No, that's a joke. Um, so here we go. And we're going to move from the Confederacy to the Northern aggressors. We're going to move into the Union, the Union, right? And the Union we're going to move to is General Ulysses S. Grant. In 1862, in late 1862, General Grant gave an order to clear an area from all Jewish residents. That area include, included Western Tennessee, it included Kentucky, it included parts of Mississippi as we're gonna see in a moment. And it became known as Gen Grant's General Orders Number 11. Here they are. December 17th, 1862, headquarters of the 13th Army Corps, Department of the Tennessee, issued in Oxford, Mississippi, December 17th, 1862. One. The Jews, as a class, violating every regulation of trade established by the Treasury Department and also department orders are hereby expelled from the departments. Two, within 24 hours from the receipt of this order by post commanders, they will see that all of this class of people will be furnished passes and required to leave and anyone returning after such notification will be arrested and held in confinement until an opportunity occurs of sending them out as prisoners, unless furnished with permit from headquarters. Three, no permits will be given these people to visit headquarters for the purpose of making personal application for trade permits by order of Major General U.S. Grant and Jonathan Aaron Rollins, Assistant Adjutant General. What was that about? What was that about? Well, before we get to what was it about, what does it say? Class of people. I'm gonna make everybody be able to talk. 
Be gone. Be gone, right? Alan, who is who be gone? All the Jews, everybody. Didn't matter why. Right. I want to make clear we know what where is. It says the departments. It's referring to the Department of the Tennessee, right? During the Civil War, when the maps were all screwed up because what state was where, what it was kind of a mess. So it's, it's a war zone. The whole thing is a war zone. The Department of the Tennessee was a geographic area over which General had authority and on behalf he was able to offer these general orders right he's in the field he has command and control of the area so in this department of the tennessee which includes northern mississippi western tennessee into kentucky from that region jews be gone why 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 mm-hmm. if you can un- where they hit them economically they can't do trade you know so- says that there's an issue of trade, right? Good. What's the issue? Hit them in their pocketbook. <laughs> Say that again? Hit them in their pocketbook, looks like to me, yeah. Ant is exercising an economic force against them. Yes, that's what I meant. Yeah, he sorry. <laughs> what is it about the Jews he's targeting? Lorraine, we can't hear you. You have to unmute yourself if we want to be want to be heard. Adelaide. One at a time, one at a time, one at a time. Raise your hand. Raise your hands. All right. Steve Feldman, go ahead. They're probably dealing in the cotton trade. So it has to do with the cotton trade, right? And as a follow-up to you, Steve, what, what kind of traders do we think Grant thought they were? Probably black market. So potentially black market, but at least untrustworthy, right? Because he says it. He says Jews as a class violating every regulation of trade established by the Treasury Department and also the department orders, meaning this department of Tennessee, right? They are engaging in unfair trade practices. And therefore, as Alan said so eloquently, be gone with you, right? Does that strike anyone as bothersome? Right? Forgetting the pragmatic piece, let's start with the historical, right? What is one of the many anti-Semitic tropes that have survived over multiple centuries? There's the money, you know, it's always about that. Philip, say it again. Now you're now, Jews, Jews and their money, always what they always say. It plays into this anti-Semitic trope that Jews are you know, tight with their money or their manipulation with money or whatever. So it clearly, you know, irks us. Um, there's a book that, that I, some of this came from called, We Called Him Rabbi Abraham, Lincoln and an American Jewry by, um, by Jonathan, or by Gary Zola. Um, and he walks through, and I'm going to share with you a couple of reasons why it's possible that Grant did this. Um, so one of it was, as Steve said, there was black market trading going on, right? That, that Jews and everybody else were engaging in black market trade, particularly of cotton. And so, you know, bribery and corruption were rife, right? And the army was, was tasked with trying to tamp down all those things because the army was basically the law in the area at that time. And so it was a thing, right? If you're an if you're a general trying to win a war, the fact that there is economic stuff going on in your department that you have to then, you know, allocate resources to try to stop that takes away from the war efforts, and it's frustrating, right? So that explains why he'd want to engage against bribery and corruption in the first place. Now, there's an irony here, um, because if you look at the history of presidencies. Um, at least through the end of the 20th century, there is one president whose corruption as president was seen as far and away the most of all of the presidents of the United States through the 20th century. Anyone want to guess which president that was? I'll give you one guess. Unmute yourselves and guess if you want to shout it out. Well, I was going to say Taft, but uh, obviously you have something else in mind. Somebody want to guess who was the most corrupt president in the 19th and 20th centuries? Grant. Grant. 
Hey, U.S. Grant, exactly. Ulysses S. Grant was considered to be the most corrupt president in, uh, up to the 20th century. I'm reserving judgment for the 21st century for now. Um, but Grant was considered to be the most corrupt president, which is ironic that while he was a general, he was concerned with corruption. But be that as it may, right? So Zola points out that it's not difficult to understand why Grant associated this black market trading with Jews, right? First of all, a lot of the traders were Jewish, right? And so it was guilt by association, either because some traders are exercising black market trading and there are a lot of Jewish traders, so the Jews must be doing it, or maybe some Jewish traders were engaging in black market trading, so get rid of all the Jews, potentially, right? Um, and he points out that you throw the stereotype of the Jew as the trader who's always looking to get ahead, and it plays into it even more. Um, but there are other hypotheses as well that I wish to share with you, right? So some have suggested that actually it came from above, right? That it, there was, it was a directive from Washington that came down to do this, right? And that Grant was basically, and I used the Nuremberg defense, which is, I was just following orders. Um, others say that it came from below, right? That some of Grant's direct reports had animus towards Jews and convinced him to put out this order, right? A lot of those, a lot of the officers in the officer corps were engaging in some of that black market trading, right? Maybe they were looking to corner the market. Maybe they were looking to enhance the edge that they got and by getting rid of certain traders, it would allow them to capture more of that. Another explanation, and this is one that gets, now, now we're getting into the interpersonal. A short time prior, and I'm reading right out of the book now, a short time prior to the issue of the order, Jesse R. Grant, the good general's father, came to the headquarters in Oxford, Mississippi, with three men from Cincinnati named Harmon, Henry, and Simon Mack. Three Yidden from Cincinnati came down to General Grant with Grant's father, Jesse, in an attempt to procure a permit to trade and purchase cotton in the South and bring it back to the Union for a sizable markup. Grant was furious at his father for engaging in what was essentially black market or blood cotton trading, right? To try to buy cotton from the South and sell it in the North during the war for a profit seemed morally corrupt to Grant. And he was furious at his father for engaging in this behavior. But it was his father. So he couldn't bring himself to punishing his father for engaging in this black market enterprise. So who did he blame? And who did he take his vengeance out at? His father's partners and their people, the Jewish people. A fourth consideration may also have contributed in some measure to all of them. Grant's well-documented drinking habits may have also messed, left his mind cloudy on an occasion or two, leading and making him particularly irritable and impulsive. No matter what the case may have been, Zola writes, it is unmistakably clear on the basis of Grant's own dispatches that himself, the best way to get to end the vexing problem of illicit trading practices would be to expel all the Jewish tradesmen from his departments so as to keep them from traveling into the South. And so this is what led him to issue this condemnable order in the words of Gary Zola. And we know this because Grant wrote it himself. He wrote a letter along with the order that we're going to see now. He wrote a letter to Wolcott, the Assistant Secretary of War, explaining his move. Who would like to read the letter? Debbie Jackman, go ahead. Sir, I have long since believed that in spite of all the vigilance that can be infused into post commanders, that the spec speculations of the Treasury Department have been violated, and that mostly by Jews and other principal traders. So well satisfied of this have I, have I been at this that I instructed the 
Comig Com Office? Commanding, a uh, shorthand. Commanding. Okay, officer at Columbus to refuse all permits to Jews to come south and frequently have had them expelled from the department. Keep going. But they come with their carpet sacks in spite of all that can be done to prevent it. The Jews seem to be privileged class that can travel anywhere. They will land at any wood yard or landing on the river and make their way through the country. If not permitted to buy cotton themselves, they will act as agents for someone else who will be at a military post with a treasury permit to receive cotton and pay for it in treasury notes, which the Jew will buy up at an agreed rate paying gold. There is but one way that I know to reach this case. That is for government to buy all the cotton at a fixed rate and sell it to Cairo, St. Louis, or some other point to be sold. Then all traders, they are a curse to the army, might be expelled. I am, sir, very respectfully, your obedient servant, U.S. Grant, Major General. Clearly from this, Grant shows that he had some kind of animus towards the Jewish people, right? He picks up on those stereotypes about Jews and says, listen, they simply can't be trusted in trading. We have a lot of problems going on down here. And the solution is, if we get rid of the Jewish traders, it will solve a lot of my problems and my headache, right? And let's buy all the cotton, let's have it, let's buy it together, let's ship it to either Cairo or to St. Louis. Um, anyone ever been to Cairo, Illinois? It's the very, very southern tip of Illinois, uh, where Illinois and Kentucky and Missouri come together. Uh, and even though they mispronounce it and they pronounce the name of their city as Cairo, it's full of Egyptian artifacts. Right, there's a Sphinx there. I've driven through a couple times, um, but it's on the river, right? It's it's where it's where the, I guess it's the Indiana River meets the Mississippi River, right? It's on it's on the it's where the rivers meet, um, and so it's a trading post, obviously. Whether he was drunk, or mad at his father's Jewish partners, or frustrated with the Jewish people who were living down there, or playing on Jewish stereotypes, or all of them combined, we see from this letter that Grant was not, you know, it wasn't a mistake. He clearly was saying the Jews in town are the problem. And so he writes this letter to explain his general orders number 11. Philip. I mean, with their carpet sacks. I mean, I've, I've heard that during my life in real estate. They used to say stuff like that in general. It didn't, it didn't want Jews. Like they, I, they've actually heard people say that, so. Carpetbagger comes. It's it's we. It comes in. I in, from my perspective, you know, really comes into play after the Civil War when you have people moving from south to north, and the idea of being the carpetbagger is that you come to a place and try to establish yourself, but really you're from somewhere else, and you're a person who's transient, right? Who isn't landed, who doesn't come from anywhere. If you don't come from anywhere, you have no roots. You have no sense of of belonging, you have no ability to be a part of anything because you're not, you're not one of us. You're one of them. You're an other. It's very othering language, right? Applied to southern whites, the southern blacks, right? That whole that whole idea. It, it certainly is a, a barb that he that he throws at the Jewish community. Madeline, Madeline, you have to unmute so we can hear you. Do you know if in Zola's book, does he uh, talk about any other nationality or race as he does about the Jews? Uh, not, a, not like this, not like this. Um, you know, and, and one of the differences, and, and this is gonna be a really big generalization, but if you think about the history of America and the history of ethnic immigration, right? Italian, Irish, Chinese, none of that happened yet, right? Those ways of integration in, in great numbers happened after the Civil War. And so the Jews were one, there were fewer others in America at the turn of the 20, at, 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 in, in the Civil War period than even 50 years later. Um, and so they may not, maybe he would have been angry at them too, who knows? Um, but 
this is an example. And, and, and both, both Gary Zola and Jonathan Sarna talk about how this episode is in some ways one of the grossest examples of discrimination and prejudice of an American government official in history, right? Because when, when, when Grant does this, he acts on the authority of the U.S. military as the general. I mean, he, as the general for the Department of the, of the Tennessee, he has full authority up to the presidency, right? He's, he's exercising that authority, and it takes, as we're going to see, appeals to the president to get it undone. Um, this is grotesque, and it's wide. Right, because it really he really does have the full force of the US government behind this action. That didn't answer your question. It answered a different question, but it gives some context. I saw Alan's hand and then I saw Sue's hand. My question was really why didn't he just forbid why didn't he just forbid trading? Period. I mean, need, he could have. They needed the money. Right? The Union Army won encourage trade they wanted to they needed the cotton it was it, you know it was hard it's hard to outlaw black market trading because it's already outlawed right this was an enforcement issue so when if in your mind if the root cause of the un uh, of the un, of the unlawlessness uh, excuse me the lawlessness if the root cause of the lawlessness are certain people and you don't want to expend the resources to try to tamp down on their lawlessness because you need the soldiers to go win the war and not serve as a police force. Another solution is get rid of the lawless people, kick them out. And that's what he tried to do here. I think that's my question. Um, I was wondering if it was ever carried out, but I um, have a feeling from what you said that it wasn't. Uh, it was briefly. It was, it was begun. We'll get there. Well, yeah, we'll see, we'll see what happens. Maddie. Hey. Go ahead, Maddie. Oh, you, wait, Maddie, now you're on mute. I'm mute again. Okay. Go ahead. All right. Um, would you say that this is a case, certainly in these times, to expose a uh, grant, you know, a, as a public figure that was uh, discriminatory and racist, and then therefore to follow some of the current thoughts of, um, you know, taking down his, his statues and, you know, just exposing him in general? So it's an interesting question. And I think that what we're going to see through the, you know, we still have another, the, the story's not over yet, folks. We've got 20 minutes left, right? There's more to this story and we'll see where, where this goes. Um, and let's return to that question at the end of the hour, because this is the, this is the first of a series of episodes um, where Grant shares some of his thoughts um, and isn't his only. Um, and I will just say that in these moments, I also think about the wisdom of Brian Stevenson, who I'm reading a lot of these days, Brian Stevenson, who wrote Just Mercy. One of his arguments for criminal justice reform is that we should not be judging people based on the worst decision they ever made. And that's yeah. Our justice system says you've made one bad decision. It's a very bad decision, but this is now your fate for the rest of your life. So I'm holding both of those ideas in my head. And Maddie, I'm going to ask you that question when we get towards the end of the hour, because we'll see how he responds later on. Debbie. Um, don't we also, also have to take into consideration just, you know, the time period, um, I sort of feel that way sometimes today that, you know, we are evolving and, and we, we may have been in a bad, you know, what was it, what looks like now is a bad place, but at, at the time, it may have been very progressive. And, and um, even today, you know, we're, we're evolving and we're moving forward. And so what we did, you know, 1960 may, may seem terrible, but it was extremely progressive at that time. Yeah. I don't think that's the case here, um, and I think of the, I think about that because the again the idea of the U.S. government, right? What really happened here? The U.S. government forbade Jews from living in certain areas of the United States. That's what the effect of this was, right? We are all, we are 70, 75 years after. Washington telling the Hebrew congregation of Newport that Jews can live under their own vine and fig tree and pursue 
you know, whatever is felicitous to them, we get this. And the reaction around it, I think, will show that, no, this was as bad as it sounds, right? This was not a misunderstanding. This was not, you know, an attempt at it being, no, this was as bad as it looked in the moment. And we'll see what the reaction was. So Caesar Caskell, who is a resident of Paducah, Kentucky, a Jewish resident of Paducah, Kentucky, is served the papers for this order, right? He is told within a day, right, because he's in the Department of the Tennessee, he and his people are told what? Pack up and move out. And so then he sends this telegram to none other than the Honorable Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States. General Orders Number 11, issued by General Grant at Oxford, Mississippi, December the 17th, commands that all post commanders to expel all Jews without distinction within 24 hours from his entire department. The undersigned, good and loyal citizens of the United States and residents of this town for many years engaged in legitimate business as merchants feel greatly insulted and outraged by this inhuman order the carrying out of which would be the grossest violation of the Constitution and our rights as good citizens under it, and would place us besides a large number of other Jewish families of this town as outlaws before the whole world. We respectfully ask your immediate attention to this enormous outrage on all and human humanity and pray for your effectual and immediate interposition. We would respectfully refer you to the post commander and post adjutant as to our loyalty and all to respect to all respectable citizens of this community as to our standing as citizens and merchants. We respectfully ask for immediate instructions to be sent to the commander of this post, D.F. Wolf and Brothers, C.F. Caskell, this was recorded, by the way, in the official record of the Union and Confederate Army, Series 1, Volume 7, Part 2, page 506, which you can get online and look at yourself, as I did. That's pretty strong, right? He pulls no punches. I need to pause for one second, because I need to plug in my computer before my laptop runs out of juice. But while I do, does someone have a comment they want to make or a question to ask in response to the good dear Caskell, brother Caskell from Paducah, Kentucky. What is he saying here? How does he respond? The Freemans, you're unmuted. Do you want to say something? The only thing I can say is that Lincoln- Louder, Lincoln louder. Listened. Lincoln listened and rescinded Grant's order. It was important to understand that the, the constitutional rights were being violated. These people in Paducah were citizens of the United States, and suddenly they were asked to uproot and leave where they had lived for years. That's enough. <laughs> Could you hear? A little, yeah, mostly. Okay, good. Repeat it though. You know how to do it, I think. Can you repeat what Howard said? Because Howard, was, it was no. a little. All right. <laughs> I agree. You agree. Thank you very much. Me too. <laughs> All right. No, Caskell says this is an outrage, right? We are good and loyal citizens. We have been loyal citizens for many years. We are, we are pillars in the community. We engage in legitimate purposes and legitimate business. For you, for the, for the good general to tell all of the post commanders around the whole department of the Tennessee to kick out all Jews is simply unconscionable, unconscionable. And he implores the one person who we know has authority over the good general the President of the United States to change and reverse the order, right? This seems as bad as it sounds that the good people of Paducah, Kentucky and other Jewish communities across the Department of the Tennessee were minding their own business, living where they had lived for generations, running their businesses, and they're told in the middle of the night or the next morning, 
you need to go. That sounds awfully familiar. It sounds exactly like the Japanese and the internment of the American Japanese in World War II. It sounds like that. It sounds like the Jews of Europe in the 20th century, right? You've been here a good time. It's time for you to go now. Pack your stuff and off you go. It sounds like it was as bad as it could have been, right? That there's no understanding Grant Grant's order other than it's as bad as it sounds. Caesar Caskell, by the way, isn't the only Jew who responds like this. Here's another person you may, you, this one you might have heard of better, Rabbi Isaac Mayer Wise, editor of the Israelite newsletter, newspaper, who at this time was, you know, was already a leader of the American Jewish community in the 1860s. And he wrote this editorial. Steps have been taken to bring this matter in proper shape before the president of the U.S., to see whether a general may with impunity derive people of their rights, which to protect he is sworn and paid for. In Cincinnati, the Reverend Doctors, Lilienthal and Wise, were appointed. That's me, by the him, like me, I'm the Reverend Dr. Wise. In Louisville, Martin Bijour, Esquire, and in Paducah, Mr. Goldsmith, were also sent on the same mission, who as one delegation proceeded to Washington to bring this matter to the notice of the administration. Therefore, we abstain from any further publication or comment on this subject. And in good rabbinic way, but I have one more thing to say. We have to say one thing more. The Cincinnati newspapers were timely informed of the outrage committed on citizens because they are Jews. In Cincinnati, thousands of Israelites live and contribute largely to the wealth of the city, to every benevolent and charitable institution, contributed largely to the military funds of various descriptions, and read the newspapers for which they pay, advertise therein, and support them otherwise. What do you think these self-same papers did? Learning of the outrageous order of General Grant? Nothing! Nothing in the world. Shame on such press. The Inquirer and the Volksfreund are the only Cincinnati papers which condemned the order of Grant, and had the manliness to speak earnest words against a wrong without precedence in American history. So we know what we have to expect of the Cincinnati press in case of emergency. So we know with what zeal those gentlemen watch over the rights of white people. So we learn what their pretensions at liberality and their declaration, declamations on freedom are actually worth. So we are aware now and facts speak of what metal they are made. The good Dr. Rabbi Wise was pretty angered. A little bit at Grant, a lot at Grant's, and a lot at his fellow citizens, his fellow newspaper editors to say, people, where are you on this? This is wrong. This is wrong, wrong, wrong. And he does good community organizing. He holds up those who did the right thing, the Inquirer and the Volksfreund, and calls everybody else out. Questions, concerns, comments about the good Dr. Rabbi Wise? Took courage. Took courage? Yeah. Listen, he's the head of the movements. He's the head of Reform Judaism in America. He's the founder of the UAHC. He's the founder of HUC. He's the founder of the CCAR. He's the grandfather of American Reform Judaism, right? He's the leader. And that's why he, that's what leadership does. Exactly right, right. You confront the wrongs face to face and you engender support for your cause by those around you. Absolutely. Wasn't it 20 years ago before he founded the UAHC and CCR? Yeah. So what did he do in those, was he in Cincinnati before he went to Albany and whatever? At this point, he was serving as rabbi and editing and editing the Israelite, which was a newspaper. Maddie. I'm curious, was there any documentation of a reaction? From whom? From any of the newspapers, any, any other organizations, um, that especially those that really wanted to celebrate civil rights of everybody. There weren't that many of those kinds of newspapers back then. 
Um, you know, one of the things that when you look deeper into the civil rights, uh, the, the Civil War era, is that the people who we think of as the heroes were, were relative heroes, right? For example, Abraham Lincoln was prepared to free the slaves, but not to give them full rights to, the, to, to formerly enslaved peoples, right? The, what, was, what the goal was, and Debbie, your comment earlier about sort of where the progressivism was or wasn't in that moment, right? What, what was progressive in that time was still regressive for us today. Um, there's not so much in, in what I've seen of, of these other newspapers uh, responding, in part because the issue does kind of dissipate fairly quickly within a matter of weeks, um, and they move on to other things. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I should have mentioned at the beginning was during the Civil War, as, as Zola and Sarna point out, during the, during the term of Abraham Lincoln, there were three issues of national importance that confronted the Jewish people. One was early in the war, the question of whether or not Jews could be commissioned and should be commissioned as chaplains in the Union Army. Um, and and when, when Lincoln acted, he acted in the positive that, yes, we should have Jewish chaplains because we have Jews fighting along Methodists and Lutherans and everybody else, and so we should have Jewish chaplains as well. But that process took longer than it should have. Um, not so much because it took long for Abraham Lincoln to intervene, but because it's like the president doesn't make every single decision, right? The decisions are often made a lower level until they get up there and then he intervenes. So that was episode number one. This is episode number two, Grant's General Orders number 11. And the third was that, that near the end of the war, as they were moving towards reconstruction and thinking about what constitutional amendments should be inserted into the constitution as a result of the succession, um, an amendment about Christianity and making Christianity the, the, the national religion of America was another battle that the Jewish community had to fight that obviously didn't go in a went in, in our favor. Um, this episode was wrapped up within a matter of weeks as we're gonna see in a moment, at least in terms of its immediate effects. So there wasn't a huge response because within a matter of days, you know, within a matter of weeks, which in the 1860s was a very fast amount of time considering how long it took for information to travel, it was, somewhat resolved, right? So this is a, this letter that, um, that Wise wrote, or this editorial, he wrote in January. But what's amazing is what happened, is that the timing of this is out of sequence, right? Because before that, six days before Wise's editorial, Caesar Caskell sat with President Lincoln in the executive mansion and had this exchange that you know was not is not a verbatim, but it's sort of been recorded in the annals of history as what the conversation went, right? So Caskell and a few people arrive at the executive mansion on the night of the third and essentially demand an audience with the president, and they're given one, and 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 Caskell reminds the president of the telegram that had been sent. Um, the, the, the belief is that Lincoln himself never actually read Caesar Caskell's telegram. It didn't get to his desk, but Lincoln is informed of it to have the meeting. And Lincoln says to Caskell, so the children of Israel were driven from the happy land of Canaan. And Caskell says, yes. And that is we have, why we have come unto Father Abraham's bosom asking protection. And Lincoln says, and this protection they shall have at once. Then seating himself at the table at a table, the president penned an order to General Henry Halleck and requested his visitors to deliver it at once. With the stroke of the pen, Abraham Lincoln overrules General Grant, right, and, and tells Grant's superior General Halleck to reverse general orders number 11. Within a matter of three weeks of it being issued, it gets overruled. And so in some ways, the the the, the issue becomes moot because the order is overruled and rescinded um, by President Lincoln himself. But this episode is a famous one, right? Because Abraham Lincoln himself plays into the biblical history of the Jewish people, right? The idea that in, in many ways, America was the promised land for 19th century Jews, that it was like Canaan, right? That we had come to. And he sees himself and casts himself Right or Caskell casts himself as a, as appealing to Father Abraham, 
right? Abraham Lincoln, Abraham and Sarah, right? He sees a connection there, right? Zola calls his book, we called him Rabbi Abraham, right? That seems like Abraham Lincoln was able to fulfill that role for us over and over again. You would think that that would be the end of the episode, right? Okay, it's done with. Grant gets overruled. He will ride off into the history as a man who exercised a really anti-Semitic action during his time as general. But what happens next a few years later? What does Grant do? What, Alan? He becomes president. He runs for president, yeah. right? He does become president. So it blows up again in 1868 during the campaign. Right. It, there's a series you, you can pull. I pulled this from the New York Times, November 30th, 1868, a series of letters back and forth about what happened during Grant's general order. And I'm and it's it's a letters back and forth about what was said, a letter sent to uh, Isaac Mayer Wise from this guy Norris saying, listen, I have this letter from General Grant about what he thinks about Jews. Here we go. Here is the letter that General Grant wrote in September of 1868 while running for president. Sir, I address you at the earnest solicitation of your friend, Honorable I.N. Norris. The sir, by the way, he's writing to is this guy, Adolf Moses. In relation to matter now generally known as Order Number 11, it would hardly surprise you that we as a people already oversensitive through former oppression and, and somethingly, should lament the issuance of that order, whatever the immediate causes might have been dictated. I am assured by high authority, some of which I might call Jewish, that no idea of special dislike to the Jews prompted you. On the contrary, that you regret the sweeping effects of the order. However generous this avowal may be on your part, yet you are well aware that a word spoken or sentence written ceases to be the property of the speaker or writer and passes into the domain of history, particularly when spoken or written by a man of supereminent position and worth. I regret that our people who love to enjoy the quiet retreat of private life should be so prominently paraded in this campaign, but the instinct of self-defiance presses utterance However, welcome to the test. By the way, I misspoke. This is written to General Grant, not from General Grant, on behalf of the Jewish people. Our demands are simply to be judged like other people and not to have the vices and shortcoming of our bad men illuminated at the expense of the many virtuals and the excellent qualities of our good men. Don't drag us into this. Don't cast us all as bad people because there are bad Jews. Don't worry about the Jewish vote, right? We're just individual people. Whatever the issue of this campaign may be, Mr. Morris assures me that you bear no ill will toward the Jewish people. And if they feel the severe compulsion to cast their suffrages against you in this campaign, they do so in many instances under protest. With them, their long stale reputation demands the greatest sacrifices even at the risk of being misunderstood for the judgment of the hour. Excuse the liberty of addressing you. I have the encouragement of one of your friends, very respectfully, Adolf Moses. And now General Grant's response. Dear sir, I am in receipt of a letter of a Mr. A. Moses of the third somewhere, enclosing one from you bearing same date. My first inclination to answer Mr. Moses because you desired it and then I thought it would be better to adhere to the rule of silence as to all letters. Were I once to commence answering all political questions asked of me, there would be not time between now and the 3rd of November to get through, right? 3rd of November, of course, being election day. Mr. Moses, I think, will readily understand this. In regard to order number 11, hundreds of letters have been written to me about it by persons of the faith affected by it. I do or did not answer any of the writers, but permitted a statement of the facts concerning the origin of the order to be made out and given to some of them for publication. I do not pretend to sustain the order. 
At the time of its publication, I was incensed by a reprimand received from Washington for permitting acts which Jews within my lines were engaging in. There were many other persons within my lines equally bad with the worst of them, but the difference was that the Jews could pass with impunity from one army to the other, and gold, in violation of orders, was being smuggled through the lines, at least so it was reported. The order was issued and sent without any reflection and without thinking of the Jews as a sect or a race to themselves, but simply as persons who has successfully, I say successfully instead of persistently, because there were plenty of others within my lines who envied their success, violated an order which greatly inured to the help of the rebels. Give Mr. Moses assurance that I have no prejudice against sect or race, but I want to each individual be judged by his own merit. Order number 11 does not sustain this statement, I admit, but then I do not sustain that order. It never would have been issued had it not been telegraphed the moment it was penned and without reflection. Yours truly, U.S. Grant. Good response. <laughs> A response. <laughs> it wasn't me. I didn't mean it. I spoke without thinking. I was pissed at some of you. It wasn't meant to be everybody. I'm not prejudiced. And it's I don't think it. So, Maddie, should we tear down his statue? You know what? I'm maybe I'm a questioning person. I'm wondering how genuine that was because look at where he had other aspirations it was convenient to apologize so i don't know yeah i don't know but but i think you make a point that one bad decision or maybe a few among many many does not make a person of bad character maybe of of bad um impulses Right. By the way, he was of bad character. There's no question. <laughs> Grant was a character, but not only for this, right? He was a drunk and he was corrupt. And he like he did all the things you don't want politicians to do. And he dabbled in anti-Semitism, right? So like his character isn't the strongest. And you're right to point out that he made he made this thing happen on, you know, right before the election, right? He's totally playing national politics with all of this. Oh. Uh, just a point. The American public is a very forgiving public. They, they just are. And we're part of that, we're part of that group. We're a forgiving group. And so it's not at all unusual for us to forgive and forget. I once sat on a jury and the um and when I was in rabbinical school, and the prosecutor who was Jewish told me after the case when we, we, we were asked if we wanted to talk with the jurors to, or with the attorneys, which we could. And she told me that she thought about striking me from the jury as a rabbinic student because I would be too forgiving. <laughs> and she's Jewish. She sits on the board. She sits on the board of one of the JCC camps in LA. And she said, listen, you were there juror number one. I knew I had to use one. Of, I would have to use one of my peremptory strikes to get rid of you. And she didn't. Um, and she lost the case, but not, not why, because she had a bad case. Um, but um, and and the and the defense was like, oh yeah, we want this guy. He's great. <laughs> um, so there's General Grant, right? And and those and and those are two episodes, you know, around the Civil War that also played into where the Jewish people and the American psyche, right, all the way up to the presidency, right? When a Jew from Paducah, Kentucky, can knock on the door of the executive mansion, and be get an audience with the president. And change the course and, and change the president's mind. So we're going to move forward next week into the period I spoke a little bit earlier about, about the, the turn of the century and immigration and really what becomes the blossoming of the American Jewish community that you and I know. Um, as an anecdote to get us there, does anybody know which city had the largest Jewish population in 1861 at the onset of the Civil War? Which American city? Charleston. Charleston. South Carolina had the largest Jewish population in 1861. The Jewish population of America that you and I know 
did not exist until the turn of the 20th century and the ways of immigration through Ellis Island that became such an important part of our history. There was a Jewish community, but it was very, very different than the one you and I know today. It's, 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 it's locuses of, of, of population were not what they were and they are today. But what's interesting from, that, from those letters is that even in 1868, the question of how the Jewish population might behave in an election season was on the national consciousness, even in 1868. Interesting. And with that, I wish you all a Shabbat Shalom and a good week. We'll see you next Thursday on July the 2nd. Thank you.